Spartan Magic, the story of the 1979 NCAA Basketball Championship, presented by the Lincoln National Life Insurance Company. At the Special Event Center in Salt Lake City, Utah, the Final Four of the 1979 NCAA Tournament. They battled their way to the national semifinals. Michigan State, Penn, DePaul, and Indiana State. Hi, I'm Bill Fleming. Once again, it's my pleasure to be your host on the Lincoln National Life Insurance Company's presentation of the NCAA Basketball Championship. During these past few years, we've really seen some great basketball in this series. Go back to 1976, when the Hoosiers of Indiana won. And then in 1977, it was the Warriors of Marquette. A year ago, it was the Wildcats of Kentucky who won their fifth NCAA Basketball Championship. Well, this year, Michigan State University won its very first NCAA title. And that's why we are here on the campus. In fact, we're standing in front of Jenison Fieldhouse, the home of the basketball team of Michigan State University. And right inside those halls rests the 1979 NCAA Basketball Championship trophy. To claim that trophy, the Spartans needed two more victories at Salt Lake City. In the first game of the semifinals, Michigan State, winner of the Mideast Regional with victories over LSU and Notre Dame, had an overall record of 24-6 against the Quakers of Pennsylvania, who were 25-5. Pennsylvania received a royal welcome from its loyal fans. The Quakers had won the East Regional, highlighted by a big upset over the North Carolina Tar Heels. They certainly had earned their first trip ever to the Final Four. Shortly after the captains met the officials, the game got underway. Michigan State scored first. And then it was Pennsylvania. On a close-in shot by number 15, Tony Price, Quaker fans showered the court with streamers, a Pennsylvania tradition after every first basket. However, for the rest of the half, Penn's shooting was ice cold. Nothing would drop. The Quakers missed a flock of layups and numerous other shots close to the basket. They also had to contend with one of the country's most talented players, number 33 of Michigan State, Irvin Magic Johnson, whose clever passes just couldn't be stopped. While the Spartans were rolling, Coach Bob Weinhauer of Pennsylvania motioned to his players to slow things down. But that didn't work. Michigan State was alert on defense, and their offensive fast break was devastating. Greg Kelser combining here with Mike Perkovich for an easy two points. For Pennsylvania, the Quakers had made only three of their first 18 shots from the floor. They tried everything. During one stretch in the first half, Penn didn't score a single point for more than eight minutes. On the other hand, Michigan State simply couldn't miss. The Spartans always seemed to have a man open, like number 11, Terry Donald. Michigan State was overpowering in the first half. Irvin Johnson alone had eight assists. Here he feeds to Kelser, who takes a few steps and stuffs it. At halftime, Michigan State led by an astounding 33 points. Coach Jed Heathcote and his Spartans left the court in disbelief. In just 20 minutes, the game had been blown wide open, and Heathcote was as surprised as anyone there. In fairness to them, I think they attacked our matchup zone very, very well, and then suddenly they, they missed so many of their inside shots in the first three or four minutes, and I think they panicked a little bit and started trying to hit from outside. Every time they missed, we went down and scored. The Spartans couldn't do anything wrong in the second half. They were on their way to a scorching 63% shooting average. A graceful hook shot by Johnson. Craig Kelser arches one, and it's a beauty. And there was absolutely no defense for this play, which started with a spectacular one-handed pass from Johnson to Mike Berkovich, who tossed to Terry Donnelly, who pumped it in for two. But give Coach Bob Weinauer and his Quakers a lot of credit. They were much more competitive in the second half, scoring on fine shots, like this underhanded scoop by Bobby Willis. In fact, the Quakers were outscored by only one point in the second half. But the deficit they incurred in the first 20 minutes was simply too much to overcome. Michigan State was a team that was peaking just right. 
led by a pair of exceptional players. Number 33, Irvin Magic Johnson. And number 32, Greg Kelser. The closest of friends on and off the court. In this game, Johnson scored 29, Kelser had 28. Final score, Michigan State 101, Pennsylvania 67. The 34-point margin was the largest ever for an NCAA semifinal or final game. And more importantly, the Spartans advanced to the championship game for the first time ever. Now it was time for the second semifinal. Number one ranked Indiana State against sentimental favorite DePaul, coached for the 37th year by 65-year-old Ray Meyer. DePaul had won the West Regional, beating Southern California, Marquette, and UCLA. At courtside, there was former Marquette coach Al McGuire speaking to Bob King, the former Indiana State coach who had to resign prior to the 79 season because of illness. King's replacement was 36-year-old Bill Hodges. He led the Sycamores to an unbeaten season, 32-0, which included a Missouri Valley Conference championship and victory in the Midwest Regional, beating Oklahoma and Arkansas. It really had been an amazing season for Indiana State, led by the fabulous Larry Bird, and now they had a chance to win it all in their very first appearance in an NCAA tournament. Indiana State, wearing the white uniforms, controlled the opening tip, the ball going to number 22, Carl Nix. He muscles his way in for a quick layout. DePaul fielded a starting team that was known as the Iron Five. They rarely made a substitution. Gary Garland, number 24, hitting on a handful of long shots, kept the Blue Demons in there close in the opening minutes. Indiana State's offense, of course, was built around college basketball player of the year, Larry Bird, who passes to Gilbert for a two-handed stop. Indiana State was a physical team, and the Sycamores used their muscle under the boards. No one enjoyed the contact more than Bird. He was a tower of straight, 6'9", 215 pounds, and at the other end of the court, he showed his tenaciousness, rebounding all the defensive boards as well. Early in the game, patience paid off for DePaul. Their fast break and fancy ball handling produced several baskets. This one by number 11, James Mitchell. Neither team was able to open a big lead with more than seven minutes remaining in the first half. Bird tied the score, 26 all, which brought a disgruntled Ray Meyer to his feet. Shaking his head in disbelief, wondering what he was seeing, Larry Bird was all over the court. Rebound, passing, scoring. This feed, Alex Gilbert giving Indiana State two more. Coming down to the closing moments of the first half, with five minutes to go, Bird's tip in once again, ties the score. Both teams were red hot. Indiana State shooting an incredible 79% compared to 59% for DePaul. The Blue Demons took the lead 34-32 when Bradshaw followed a missed shot. The margin went to four points when number 30 Curtis Watkins worked his way in to score on an underhanded shot. In the final three minutes of the first half, everybody contributed for Indiana State. Number 23, Steve Reed, hitting from 18 feet out. Penetrating inside, Carl Nix feeds number 40, Brad Miley, and he puts Indiana State ahead, 40 to 38. Then a layup by Watkins, enabled to pull to tie the score at 40 all. That's when Coach Bill Hodges urged the Sycamores to maintain their poise. And they did with another key basket from Steve Reed. This time from on top the circle. Larry Bird has the uncanny ability to shake himself loose for that fraction of a second to let the ball go. He tore the nets apart of the first half on near perfect shooting, making 11 out of 12 field goals and one out of two free throws for 23 points. At halftime, Indiana State led 45 to 42. It had been a tightly played game. Neither team led by more than four points. The score was tied 15 times. Coach Ray Meyer planned his strategy in a desperate effort to contain Bird. But it was Bird who scored the opening basket of the second half for Indiana State. DePaul struggled to get going. Their first score coming on Mark Aguirre's turnaround jumper at the 58 second mark. Almost another minute passed before the Blue Demons were able to score again. They worked the ball into Aguirre. He rammed it home. 
Meanwhile, the Larry Bird Show continues. This field goal, his 12th straight without a miss, increased Indiana State's margin to nine points. The Sycamores were pulling away now, leading 55 to 46. DePaul still couldn't compete with Indiana State on the board. The result, two more points for Bird. Then a strange thing happened. With 14 minutes left to go in the game, and Indiana State leading by eight points, the momentum changed in favor of DePaul. After a missed shot, Gary Garland rebounded, fed to Clyde Bradshaw on the fast break, and this slam dunk seemed to ignite DePaul's sluggish offense. Then Aguirre dribbled between his legs and popped it from 17 feet. From the baseline, number 11, James Mitchum, chopped Indiana State's lead to just four points, 61-57. The Blue Demons had put it together, much to the delight of their faithful followers. But Indiana State refused to panic. They worked deliberately, looking for the high percentage shot. And it came here on that perfect pass from Bird to Leroy Staley. Then Indiana State went back ahead by eight as Bob Heaton connected from the baseline. Coming up, another outstanding play by the Bird. What ball control he shows here. Plays like this can fire up a team. So with less than nine minutes to go, DePaul called a timeout to talk things over. It was Indiana State 67, DePaul 61. The next four minutes belonged to DePaul. The big surge started with a basket by Aguirre, who was the nation's highest scoring freshman in 79. Along the way, Bird scored one more time and significantly he would be his last basket of the game. Less than six minutes to go, and there was no stopping Aguirre. With his layup, DePaul trailed by only two. Now with a chance to tie it up, Ray Meyer instructed the Blue Demons to take their time. They did, and Aguirre's turnaround jumper tied it, 71 all. DePaul then forced Indiana State into a turnover. Clyde Bradshaw stole the ball, and Gary Garland put the Blue Demons ahead for the first time in the second half. Now it was anybody's ball game. The winner would meet Michigan State in the finals to determine the 1979 NCAA champion. DePaul had an opportunity to increase its lead to four points, but here they committed one of their few turnovers in the game, a crucial mistake. On the next possession, Indiana State scored the tying basket on a marvelous pass from Bird to Bob Heaton. The ball jumped in front 74 to 73 on a free throw, but another Heaton layup put Indiana State back on top 75 to 74. Only 36 seconds left on the clock. The ball down by one point called a timeout. Ray Meyer explained his strategy. The ball was to get the ball in low to Aguirre. If that didn't work, to take the first good shot. And here's what happened. Indiana State forced Aguirre outside, where he was immediately confronted by Miley and Nix. He had to take an almost impossible shot from the deep corner. It bounced off the rim to Leroy Staley of Indiana State, who was fouled with one second left. The Sycamores were confident of victory, as they hugged each other in celebration. Staley went on to make the free throw, putting Indiana State ahead 76 to 74, and now DePaul needed a miracle. But it didn't happen. Their full court desperation pass was easily broken up, and the game was over. The Sycamores had lifted their record to 33 and 0 and moved into the finals. Ray Meyer and Bill Hodges congratulated each other. It was a terrific ball game. Indiana State fans thoroughly enjoyed their favorite victory song. Then, some 48 hours later, DePaul was involved in another thriller, the game for third place with the Pennsylvania Quakers. The Quakers sent that battle into overtime on a jumper by James Salters. Pennsylvania had overcome a 23-point deficit to tie it up. And then, in the five-minute overtime period, Mark Aguirre scored eight of his game-high 34 points in leading DePaul to an exciting 96-93 victory.
And so the scene was set for the championship game. Michigan State against Indiana State. Both teams seeking their first national title in basketball. A capacity crowd of more than 14,000 screaming fans on hand at the Special Event Center. The city of Salt Lake City rocked with enthusiasm. There is nothing like the finals of an NCAA basketball tournament. The game was billed as the showcase for two of the nation's best players. Smooth and gifted Larry Bird of Indiana State, everybody's player of the year. A unanimous selection on five All-America teams. In the other corner, Urban Magic Johnson, the great one from Michigan State. The Magic Man had also made five All-America teams. He was confident about Michigan State winning this game. I don't scout people. I don't like to watch games. Because I know if we do the things we can do best, if we run our offense, we play our defense, that no team in the country can uh, handle Michigan State. Naturally, one of Judd Heathcote's biggest worries was how to stop the bird, who had scored 35 points in the semifinals against DePaul. Judd talked about it. Bird is such a, a superlative passer that we just felt that he could kill us as well passing as he could shooting. We instructed our other three players to play only the passing lanes and ignore him completely. Sometimes a top player just mesmerizes the other uh, uh, team as Irvin Johnson will do on occasion. Sure enough, it was Bird's playmaking talents that provided Indiana State with its first couple of baskets. Here, he whips one to Steve Reed. And speaking of pinpoint passing, Greg Kelser of Michigan State did it this way, resulting in a stuff by Ron Charles. The Spartans were an explosive team. Irvin Johnson triggered the attack in so many different ways. Here, he grabs a rebound. Drives the length of the court, exhibiting the extraordinary skills that made him such a delight to watch. And after scoring, he responds in typical Johnson style. While Johnson was performing his magic tricks, Larry Bird tried to crack Michigan State's zone defense with his outside shooting. He was fouled on this play, much to the... Uh, Larry Bird was defensing Gregory Kelser, and Greg in that game became more of a passer. And that's for sure. Kelser set up this basket on a fine pass to Terry Donnelly. Greg Kelser's overall performance in the first half played a major role in the Spartan success. Here, he drives around Bird and scores on a left-handed layup. On defense, Kelser was the key in helping contain Bird. He explained his assignment this way. Well, the thing that I had to do was when he came on my side of the zone, I had to definitely be aware of his presence. And when he got the ball, I had to be right there in his face. Uh, any shots that he was going to take were going to have to be contested. We couldn't let him have open shots. We also couldn't let him stand out there with the ball and throw uncontested passes so as to pick us apart. So every time he got the ball, there was somebody on him. And then when he put it down on the ground, there usually was a man and a half, maybe two men on him. From another angle, let's take a look at how much trouble Larry Bird was having trying to get open. The Spartans covered him like a blanket. And when he did get the ball, he had to force many of his shots. Nevertheless, Larry Bird worked tirelessly trying to get free. Never in his career had he labored so hard to get a basket. At last. 11 minutes into the game, Michigan State increased its lead to eight points when Irvin Johnson banked this one in. The Spartans had set the tempo of the game. They were playing their brand of basketball, much to the satisfaction of their coach. A jumper by Carl Nix of Indiana State made it Michigan State 30, Indiana State 23. The Sycamores were trailing now by only seven, despite their inconsistency. With five minutes to go in the first half, Bill Hodges tried to restore the confidence of his players. But Michigan State continued to dominate at both ends of the court. One of the trademarks of this Michigan State team was its dazzling passing game. Before the half ended, the Spartans scored on this exciting alley-oop pass from Johnson to Kelsey. 
It was their favorite play, as Johnson explained. It's more or less of an uh, instinct thing where he'll look at me and, and he'll break up high real quickly. And his, if this man is on him tight or overplaying him, he go right back and I just throw it. And it always worked. Another obstacle Indiana State faced in the first half was Michigan State scrambling, clawing defense. Oftentimes, the Sycamores got only one shot and only one rebound. You won't find better defensive play than that displayed here by Greg Kelsey. Now, that's the way to play deep. No one on the Indiana State bench was more frustrated than assistant coach Mel Daniels. And it was understandable. Michigan State had played exceptional basketball. And then... With only 14 seconds left in the half, the Spartans all of a sudden had a problem. Heading up court, Kelser bumped into Larry Bird and picked up his third personal foul. To make matters worse, Irvin Johnson also had three. And that certainly gave the Spartans something to think about at halftime. With the score 37 to 28 in favor of Michigan State. the special guest at the championship game was John Wooden, the former Purdue great, who had coached at Indiana State before leading the UCLA Bruins to 10 NCAA basketball championships. The Spartans opened with the second half blitz, scoring seven straight points. Terry Donnelly from the corner. Bullseye. Not so fortunate was Indiana State. Michigan State continued to apply pressure, and Indiana State didn't score the first three times it had the ball. On this play, Greg Kelser showing some of his fancy moves. A fadeaway jumper from a tough angle. Michigan State took a 16-point lead at the 16-43 mark. Again, the Spartans called on Donnelly. And the man with the hot hand made his second straight basket from the corner. What a performance. Donnelly couldn't even believe it himself. He kept feeding me, and... Uh... Fortunately, they were going in for me, and I, it, it was something different for me because I haven't, I haven't been a shooter. Donnelly's torrid shooting continued. His long-range jumpers accounted for two more baskets, giving Michigan State a commanding 48-32 lead. Everything seemed to be going right for the Spartans until Greg Gelser banged into Larry Bird and committed his fourth personal foul. With more than 15 minutes remaining in the game, Judd Heathcote now had to substitute for Kelser, who was the top scorer and rebounder in Michigan State history. Kelser's departure was now forcing Heathcote to make some changes. When Gregory uh, went to the bench, I think uh, we instructed Irvin to uh, kind of take over and maybe play a little bit of ball control and uh, be a little more conservative. I think we lost our momentum, and uh, giving uh, Indiana State credit, they just kept after us and kept coming back, but therefore uh, a long stretch why we went almost scoreless for four or five minutes and enabled them to creep back into the ball game. And that's the kind of break Indiana State had been hoping for. From outside, Bob Heaton scores on a jumper. On defense, Indiana State played with much more intensity. The Sycamores completely disrupting the Michigan State attack. And the Spartans throw the ball away. With Kelser sitting on the bench with four fouls, Michigan State was a different team. And so was Indiana State. Coach Bill Hodges and his assistants were fired up. Watch this nifty move by Carl Nix, number 22. Four defenders in pursuit, shovels the pass to Staley, and he scores it from underneath. An important basket, and Staley's first of the game. Indiana State was now flying. Larry Bird getting the ball in the crowd, hitting from the baseline, and he cuts Michigan State's lead to nine points. With a little better than 11 minutes to go, Indiana State's full court press forced Michigan State into another turnover on a Carl Nix interception. Believe it or not, the Spartans had scored only one basket in four minutes of play. No longer were they in command. On this Carl Nix jumper, Indiana State narrows the difference to eight. 52 to 44. The Sycamores have the ball once again. They take their time, carefully working the ball to Bird. And he cuts Michigan State's lead to six. 
Indiana State had staged an amazing comeback, and Judd Heathcote was hopping mad. The Indiana State fans were delighted, but they also had reason to be concerned because Greg Kelser had returned to the Michigan State lineup. And it didn't take long for the Spartans to recover. From the top of the circle, a perfect pass and a stuff by Johnson. And he draws a foul at the same time. It's an airborne foul. And that gives Johnson two shots instead of one. Magic made them both, resulting in a four-point play. And Michigan State led 61 to 50 with five minutes to go in the game. And that may very well have been the turning point of the championship. Bill Hodges knew that time was running out. And Indiana State was having trouble at the free throw line. With only a minute left, Urban Johnson's inbound pass traveled almost the length of the court, right on target to Greg Kelser. Another beautiful play. Johnson and Kelser, partners in destruction. Michigan State led 67 to 58, and the Spartan fans started chanting. The game was just about over. Indiana State hustled down court for one last effort from Steve Reed. Topping it all off was Urban Johnson's over-the-shoulder pass to none other than Greg Kelser, who officially ended the game with a thunderous stop. The Michigan State Spartans had won their first national championship in a 75-64 victory over Indiana State. The dream had come to an end for Larry Bird and Indiana State. Judd Heathcote was mobbed on the court. The Michigan State celebration was just beginning. The Spartans had entered what was referred to as the Magic Kingdom, and Urban Magic Johnson had a lot to do with it. He was voted the tournament's most outstanding player. And finally, Greg Kelser, who wanted everybody to know that Michigan State was indeed number one. Well, there it is, Spartan Magic. It was that magic that carried them to the very heights of the NCAA Basketball Championship in 1979. This is Bill Fleming on behalf of the Lincoln National Life Insurance Company, thanking you very much for being with us and inviting you to become part of the NCAA Basketball Championship picture of 1980, when the scene for that tournament will be Market Square Arena in Indianapolis, Indiana. We hope your favorite team's there.